in previous updates, <coughs> we talked about um, FRTB and the importance of data for FRTB. And in fact, if to get FRTB correct, uh, the complexity is actually in the data. Covered concepts like time series, instrument lineage, data aggregation. You get those fundamentals correct, the calculations are a lot more straightforward. So what we're going <coughs> to kind of extend that to today is what we're seeing generally in the industry is that concept but extend it um, and the importance of data and data standardization not just for FRTB but across the board um, and what we're really seeing is a kind of a redefinition of the boundaries between data and financial market calculations. Uh, financial market calculations probably you know, this is one of the kind of standards that I think companies like Golden Source and we're actively pushing is standards for those data definitions. Uh, one of the standards we've come up with are um, front office quantitative calculations versus finance and risk calculations. Front office calculations are uh, the calculation of mark to markets uh, valuations uh, based on trades and some of them quite complex trades that um, that traders put on and need to be valued but and a lot of that seems very complex but when you're looking at things like we do from purely a data perspective you, you've got to standardize you've got to simplify and I think that generally helps with uh, understanding of um, what's going on in reality uh, so some of the standards that we've come up with and we're pushing actively in our documentation and methodologies, one of them I, I mentioned it, you know, there is a, a clear definition between or a clear separation between front office calculations, mark to market calculations versus finance and risk calculations. Front office calculations are typically nonlinear. Um, you take uh, future cash flows associated with, uh, with some of these products that are traded you've got to assess the probability of whether they will occur or not, and then you've got to discount them. Um, they're typically front office kind of calculations. They're more involved than finance and risk calculations. <coughs> finance and risk calculations are often use the concept of risk sensitivity. So you take uh, sensitivities to risk factors, and you can, which are in effect approximations uh, or can be used to approximate some of the calculations that happen in the front office. Um, bid offer reserves, IPV calculations, prudential valuations, um, model reserves, uh, P&L adjustments. These are all typically finance and risk calculations from a market risk perspective, value at risk, uh, shocking risk sensitivities, etc. But that, again, it's another example of how we think it's important to take what seems to be this kind of blur of complexity and break it up into things that are you know, bite-sized chunks that are easily understandable. And actually, when you look at things from a purely data perspective, you have no choice. You, you've got to do these higher level simplifications and you've got to make sure you understand how that data interacts with the calculations. Uh, traditionally, and I think we've said this on some of the previous updates we've given, that uh, traditionally these were two very different spheres within a bank or hedge fund or wherever the calculations were happening. They were very much about, we'll do the kind of complex models, IT does the data. I don't think that works anymore. I think you really have to have people that do the data very well and to do the data very well, you've got to be able to understand what's happening in terms of the models and the risk calculations. So as I say, that clear separation between uh, front office calculations, model-based calculations uh, versus finance and risk calculations. Uh, we build some methodology around that. It's a clear example of that kind of separation. Um, another example is <clears throat> the concept of calibrating market data. Um, again, you know, when you first come across the topic, you know, calibrating market data, what is calibrating? It just, it seems incredibly complex. But actually, from a data perspective, we've got to step back again and say, really, what's happening here? And 
what's happening is inventory needs to be priced. Uh, so if you are a car salesman, uh, you've got your inventory, it's your cars, you've got your prices, prices go up, you make money, prices go down, typically you're, you're going to lose money. In banking, you've got your inventory, which is your trades and positions, and you've got your pricing, which is your prices of your bonds, your equities, prices that sit on curves and surfaces. And if they go in your favor, you'll make money every day. If they go against you, you lose. Same basic concept. The only difference, well, one of these fundamental differences, I think, between the banking world and the rest of the world is those prices that go into pricing your inventory need to be transformed. And that's really where this concept of calibration comes in. You can't just take, grab some prices from the market, shove it into your model and hope that it'll work. Those models tend to be complex, um, if I'm being complimentary, finicky and bespoke and uh, have a lot of internal IP built in that was probably more realistic. Um, so they need to take uh, market data that has been transformed and very specific to the models themselves so that they can generate the mark to markets using uh, a highly specified market data feeds. That process of taking that kind of raw market data, converting them into calibrated market data or risk factors, or translated data, or derived data, lots of uh, kind of terminology, different terminology that you use. Generally, I would see that as just the calibration process. A really good example of it is uh, bootstrapping a yield curve. You take raw market data, deposit rates, futures, swaps, pass them into a library of some sort, take back the translated data. That translated data, the calibrated data, can now be used to price your inventory. Again, if you look up some of the uh, industry documentation out there, some of the model documentation, and there is books and books of this stuff, it is hard to see the wood for the trees. But really, that's what's happening. Inventory needs to be priced. The models that need to price them need the prices and those rates in a very specific format. So you've got to take the prices and the rates pass them through an internal library, translate them, they become calibrated market data or, or risk factor data that can now be used to price your inventory to calculate your daily p &L. So That's probably the second example of the standardization uh, that's happening generally in the market and where we're kind of pushing as data professionals. So first one was finance versus risk, uh, finance and risk calculations versus front office calculations. Uh, the second one I said there is taking raw market data, calibrating it using internal libraries to come up with calibrated or risk factor data. Probably a, a third one now that's kind of interesting is just the use of time series data generally. Uh, so taking um, prices historically uh, so that you can look at, again, some of the complexity there is saying, generating kind of shocked market data etc but we kind of look at it slightly differently it's uh you need historical prices because you need to know on which day in the past did i lose the most money because that's typically what i need to kind of do my capital calculations for um so what we're generally finding is even though that tends to be a risk concept uh store historical daily prices, generate uh, shocked uh, risk factor, uh, shocked risk factor data for publishing to risk engines. Um, that time series data is now becoming uh, used and available across the organization. So people are putting a lot of time and effort and money into time series to clean, scrub it, validate it for FRTB purposes. But um, as the industry is uh, spending all of this money, uh, FRTB related, they're saying, what kind of benefits can we have here? So having centralized, validated historical prices for use by the rest of the organization, in a way, is a kind of a, a standardization of something that is market risk specific for use within the organization and helps justify FRTB budgets. So again, another example of 
how we're taking what are sometimes perceived to be complex topics, but as data professionals, we really can't afford that. We've got to break it down into simple, understandable, well-defined areas that you can model from a data perspective and relate that then to you know, this kind of perceived complexity within models. And when you do that, I think it really helps you to understand and helps you bridge that gap and helps you redefine those boundaries between, uh, between data and the financial market calculations that happen in both buy side and sell side uh, institutions.